The BSc Level 1 accreditation was launched in 2018, and in the five years since it was launched, close to 100 candidates have successfully completed the accreditation process. Most candidates were successful at the first attempt. However, not everybody was, and with that in mind, I've produced this short video to walk you through the accreditation process and make sure you know what to expect on the day of a practical assessment. Your guide going forward is going to be the BSc Level 1 accreditation pack, and that can be downloaded from bsecho.org. And the accreditation pack is updated regularly, so it's important that when you're starting out, you make sure you've got the most up-to-date version. It's not possible to gain and develop the skills required for focused echocardiography if you're working completely alone. And so before you begin this journey, you must identify a mentor who must possess not only the required practical skills and knowledge, but also needs to have enough time to commit to your development. So who would be a suitable mentor? Clearly it needs to be somebody with a significant amount of transthoracic echo experience. So we'd be looking at somebody who's already got the BSc Level 2 accreditation or the Critical Care ACE accreditation, or maybe they've got the BSc Level 2 TOE accreditation, but with some additional transthoracic experience. They may be working towards one of the higher BSc Level 2 accreditations, have passed the written exam, and be well on their way with their logbook. Or perhaps they've passed the BSc Level 1 accreditation, and they've been practicing Focused Echo for at least another 12 months. Alternatively, they could have the European Society of Cardiology accreditation or the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine's EDEC qualification. It might be that you've identified someone who you feel has all the necessary skills to be a mentor, but isn't already on this list. And if that is the case, then that might be possible but must be done with the prior agreement of the accreditation team. And the email to contact the team can be found within the accreditation pack. When first learning echocardiography, you'll need to develop in tandem both the practical skills required to acquire the images, as well as the theoretical knowledge required to interpret the images, and put these together in the context of the patient in front of you. You'll acquire the practical skills by completing a logbook of at least 75 cases. Some of these will be performed directly supervised by your mentor, whereas others you'll perform alone with the images and the report subsequently reviewed and critiqued. Now, if your scan is also being used for patient management rather than being performed solely for the purpose of education, then it may be that you'll use a departmental reporting tool and this will form part of the patient's medical record. This is absolutely fine, but needs to be done in addition to using the BSc Level 1 reporting tool as this is what you're going to submit for your accreditation. All right, let's take a look at an example report and see how it should be completed. So on the BSC's website, we've got both a PDF and a Word document that you can download. And you're welcome to either print it out, fill it in by hand and then scan it, or complete it electronically. At the top of a report, the first row allows you to input patient identifiers. So this is the patient's name, medical record number, date of birth. And all of this information is important if you're going to be filing this in the patient's medical record, but ensure that any reports that you upload to the BSC's portal don't contain this information. So either leave it blank, or if it's already completed, you can use a masking tool to mask it out. The next row below that has got space for your details, so your name, when you've performed the scan, and where in your logbook this scan falls. The next section is the information you have about the patient that's going to put the scan into context. So who is this patient? How old are they, male or female, where are you scanning them, a little bit about their hemodynamics, and importantly something about the clinical scenario. In what way is this patient unwell, and why are you performing this scan? What's the question that you're trying to answer? Below this you'll find the reporting matrix. The first two boxes of which contain the only two measurements we're going to ask you to make in your patients, which is the left ventricular internal diameter in diastole, and the TAPSI. And we'd expect to see you making this measurement in the vast majority of your reports. Below this are a number of rows, each of which refers to a particular structure or function of that structure within the heart that you're going to be seeing on a level one scan. And what we'd like you to do is to choose one answer per row and ensure that each row has got one answer and only one answer. If you're filling this in by hand, you might want to circle that answer and if you're filling in a Word document or a PDF electronically, then shade in the answer that you think is the correct, or at least the most correct. 
And if you feel that there's a part of a heart that you can't see adequately in order to make a conclusion, then tell us that by selecting unable to assess U slash A in the fourth column on the right hand side of the matrix. If we then turn our attention to the second page of reporting template, there's a couple of free text boxes which you should complete. The first gives you space to document any additional findings which can't be documented on the reporting matrix. So for example, this might be a mass adherent to a valve or a VSD, for example. And below that we have what we consider to be probably the most important of all the boxes on the report, which is the space for your conclusion. So you don't need to go through everything on the reporting matrix and repeat that information here. What you do need to do is highlight any major findings, particularly if they relate to the clinical question that's being asked. You might want to use this space to elaborate on answers you've given in the reporting matrix. So for example, if a patient has significant mitral regurgitation, then it may be that you want to have a go trying to explain the etiology of that regurgitation here. If there are important negatives, I might stress those. So for example, a patient with PE, you might want to make a point of saying that the right ventricle isn't dilated and its function isn't impaired. You may be making clinical decisions and you may wish to do document management advice. And what we want to see for every report that's submitted is whether or not you feel this patient requires a level two scan. And that absolutely won't always be necessary but it's likely to be necessary if there is major pathology. Below this, the next section is for your mentor to fill out. Or if it's more convenient, you can fill this out, but after discussion with your mentor. So this is where you get your feedback, and this should be completed for every report that you perform. There are sections where the mentor can feedback about image acquisition, how you might try and improve your images, as well as space for their feedback regarding your image interpretation. It's possible that your mentor was with you when you performed the scan, or perhaps you're meeting face-to-face -face at a later date, or you're catching up over some video conferencing software. Whichever is the case, let us know by selecting that answer too. Now, when you're collecting cases for your logbook, it's important that you're scanning the right sorts of patients. So these are predominantly acutely unwell patients who could be pre-hospital, in the ED, on the ward, in the ICU or operating theatre, but no more than one third of your cases should be in stable outpatients. In addition, there are some particular pathologies that you need to be looking out for. And the cases that you present in your logbook should show a mixture of LVRV failure and significant valve disease, as well as pericardial effusions and patients in hypovolemic shock. No more than 20 cases in your logbook should show no significant pathology. In addition to completing your logbook, you'll also need to study the theory required to interpret level 1 echocardiograms. In the appendix of the accreditation pack, there's a curriculum that outlines the information that you're expected to know. And over the course of the accreditation process, it's likely that you're going to access a number of resources to get this information. And that's likely to include face-to-face -face courses, online courses, textbooks, guidelines and journals. As you near the end of the accreditation process, your supervisor will be asked to sign the online portal to say that they're satisfied that you have the required knowledge. All of this is leading up to the BSc Level 1 examination. So the examination has got three components, sometimes referred to as stations. Component A is a review of the logbook reports that you've submitted in advance of the examination day. Here the examiners will go through a selection of the uploaded reports and we'll check that each of the reports meets the criteria that are listed on the screen. If we think about the reasons why people have struggled with component A in previous sittings of the exam, then there are some common themes, which are listed on the screen now. One of the main problems that have been seen in the past is having too many studies performed in an outpatient setting. So to be clear, you absolutely can perform studies in the outpatient setting. And this is a fantastic opportunity to develop technical skills and receive one-to-one -one tuition. And if you're lucky enough to be in a position to get that sort of supervision, then that's great. But it should constitute not more than one third of your logbook. Sometimes when scanning patients in outpatients alongside a level two echocardiographer, the study will be looking to answer questions which could never be answered with focused echo. For example, tracking the aortic valve area 
of a patient with known aortic stenosis. And when you're completing your level 1 report, you should stick to answering those questions that Focused Echo is designed to answer. If the examiners feel that the logbook that's been submitted doesn't adequately cover the breadth of pathologies that Level 1 Echo is designed to look for, then you may be asked to perform additional scans and submit additional reports before completing Component A. Components B and C are tested at the Practical Assessment Day, which is held at different outpatient departments throughout the country several times per year. Traditionally, candidates usually sit Component B first, although it's possible that the order will be switched around, depending on the availability of different examiners. Component B is designed to test your ability to generate and acquire 2D and M-mode images that are correctly aligned and have been optimised with respect to sector size, focus point and gain. In addition, you'll be asked to use colour Doppler, where the examiners are principally concerned with your ability to select the correct size and box position and you're likely to be asked to make at least one measurement out of LV internal diameter in diastole and TAPSI. Traditionally, this has been done using ultrasound machines to scan live models who may be patients or healthy volunteers. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been necessary to occasionally use simulators to take the place of healthy volunteers. And so conceivably, you'll be asked to scan either a person or a mannequin. So let's talk through what happens during Station 2 when we're testing Component B. So the first thing to say is that only image generation is being tested here. So you won't be asked to comment on what anatomy is on view, or whether the anatomy that you're seeing is normal. All of the points that are being awarded are awarded for the technical aspects of the scan, and so for every single view that you record, ensure that you've not only correctly aligned the image, but you've considered sector size, so depth and width, and optimised these, ensure that the focal point is in the optimal position, and have adjusted the gain, so that's regional gain, as well as global gain. In addition to scoring points for the scan quality, you can pick up points for confirming the patient's identity by asking them to confirm their name and date of birth and double checking their medical record number. For each of the views that you attempt, make sure the patient's in the optimal position. So for much of the scan, this will be in the patient in the left lateral position with the left arm raised and the hand behind the head. But of course, for the subcostal views, you'll want the patient on their back. If ECG leads are available to you, then you should use these. So at the start of the scan, you've got up to five minutes to get the patient in the correct position, apply the ECG stickers and leads, input the patient's demographics into the machine, and get ready to begin scanning. You'll then have 16 minutes to work through eight views that have been selected from a minimum data set. These views vary between different exams, but you should expect that the majority of these views will be 2D images, but you will be making at least one measurement and using color Doppler to assess the valvular regurgitation. At the end of the 16 minutes, you'll be offered another four minutes if you'd like them to go back and repeat any views that you weren't happy with first time around. It's very likely that you might be using a machine you've never used before and are unfamiliar with the controls. And in this situation, the examiners will be happy to guide you, but you have to tell them what it is you'd like to adjust. So, for example, if you say you're not happy with a sector size and you want to adjust for width and depth, then the examiners will happily show you where these controls are but expect you to use them yourself. Whilst component B is entirely about assessing your ability to generate images, component C is all about image interpretation. In this component of the examination, you'll be given a laptop with a number of real life studies from real patients preloaded. And for each study, you'll have 10 minutes to review the images as many times as you like and answer all of the questions on the reporting template, as well as writing a detailed conclusion. In previous iterations of a practical assessment, we found that the majority of candidates pass component B at the first attempt, whilst component C has proven to be more challenging. And to my mind, this seems to suggest that image acquisition tends to be learnt sooner than accurate image interpretation. Once you've completed your report, it's handed to the examiners who mark it against an idealised answer. Now I'm often asked what is the pass mark for component C? and essentially it's 100%, i.e. you're expected to be able to accurately diagnose all major abnormalities whilst not labelling any normal structures as abnormal. Now of course there are cases when a particular assessment sits right on the borderline between two potential answers, uh, so I'm going to take you through three cases of mitral regurgitation and explain how you might want to approach answering these 
in your practical assessment. So on this first case, we can see that there is some light regurgitation present, but it's a very, very small amount just sitting there between the, uh, the leaflets. And it would be incorrect to call this significant mitral regurgitation. This MR is, is very small and unlikely to be patient, making the patient sick. In this second case, we can see a very large jet of mitral regurgitation that's filling a large proportion of the left atrium. And the only possible correct answer here would be significant regurgitation. In this third case, we can see that there is some MR present. It's directed underneath the posterior mitral valve leaflet, and it's an eccentric jet that's hugging the free wall of the left atrium. This is conceivably just mild, but the eccentricity means it may be underestimated. In this particular case, it would probably be acceptable to answer either regurgitation present not significant or significant regurgitation. But in a borderline case like this, the candidate would do well to elaborate on their answer within their conclusion. Alright, so those are the three components of the Level 1 accreditation process. I hope this video has been useful in showing you what to expect when embarking on this accreditation. And all that remains is to wish you the best of luck.